guitarist Marty Wilson Piper. We gather you guys collaborate on a lot of material. Yeah, it's three songwriters and three singers, and and Richard who plays the drums. Oh God, how can I start and say all this? Right? I mean, I I got to start right at the beginning to go into all this. In 1980, <laughs> I left England after my group split up. And I went to Australia. I'd been in the country for three weeks, and I saw the church play because of a friend of a friend. And um, two weeks later, I was in the group, basically. And they were looking for a guitarist, and I just thought they were so good. Now, Steve was the main songwriter, but I mean, I just thought it was really good. I sort of didn't care who the bloody main songwriter was, you know. It was like, hey, this is a great band, you know. I'd like to be involved in it. And um, then, of course, came the thing, the situation of it being great to be in a great band, but also frustrating to be in a band where I wasn't main, the main songwriter. I used to contribute songs to each of the... I mean, I've got a... I co-wrote Don't Open the Door to Strangers mm -hmm. way yeah. back then on the first album, and I sung Field of Mars on Blue Crusade and co-wrote three of the songs in that album. Um, Remote Luxury, Seance, Steve wrote most of the songs apart from one. Um, Remote Luxury, I had two songs on, and um, I think it was... A couple of co-writes on there as well. And then Heyday was um, mainly a band written album as Starfish, you know. Um, and I think that it's, it's a, a mixture of things that have made that happen. I mean, it, we evolved into a band that learnt about songs, songwriting, working together and writing together. The band writes a certain type of song which is really uh, missing in rock music today. I agree I with think. you. You know, like the north, south, east, west side of the church, uh, songs like that. You, I mean, Peter's Peter's actually been putting it really well recently. He's, he's been, the last couple of weeks, he's been running around saying things like, I just realised something. There's no rock and roll around anymore. You know, there isn't any kind of like rock groups. You know, there's pop groups and there's dance groups and there's funk groups and there's kind of weird groups and but there isn't any kind of like rock groups that are in between that aren't stupid you know it's like the world needs a rock group that isn't stupid you know maybe the church can be a rock group that isn't stupid where do you see the evolution going i mean we've only made two albums where we all wrote the songs that's interesting you know i mean i see it growing and going a lot further uh we've sort of probably realized that uh one of the best albums we ever made, which is this one, has got a lot of great songs in it, and most of them we wrote together. But it's interesting to have this kind of thing too, where we all write songs, we all sing, we all have solo record deals, you know. Yeah. There's this huge arena of places to put the ideas that we create, you know. And like, it's important for us to make sure that the right things are going in the right hole, <laughs> you know. And like, uh, I think there's room for diversity's sake to have. Pete and I and Steve writing individually for the church as well as together and also there's room for us to write individually and release our own records. One of my favorite songs is your song, Spark. What does that song tell us about you? What does it tell you about me? Right. Surely you should be telling me that. Well, I... <laughs> Just before the church was dropped by its 68th record company, um, we, I was doing some acoustic gigs and that song was written during that period um, when I was suddenly came to the conclusion that I could write a song at 7 o'clock on a Friday and at 6 o'clock the following night play it on stage to an audience, you know. And um, I was sort of getting into this thing about writing a lot of acoustic songs. Um, my new solo record, which is coming out, Art Attack, that's got a lot of acoustic songs on it which were, I performed and wrote during, during that period. To answer your question about Spark, it shows a side of, of the church which might not necessarily be there in some ways. That song points to the fact that I do have a sort of rockier and poppier sensibility. But I don't think that's n where I'm at either. That's just a part of me that I have. Um, I sort of, I mean, I've got as many delicate, lyrical, beautiful, melodic, cascading songs as... as as I have, you know, up-tempo pop songs, you know. How do the solo <laughs> projects coexist with the band projects that you work on? They make the band breathe beautifully. They really do, you know, because it means that, that 
the church albums don't become this thing where everybody's fighting for, you know. If I don't get a song on this album, that's the end of me for the next three years. I think what, what makes a church different from a, a standard four-piece band that would have two guitars and a bass and a drum is, I think, is the interplay between you and Peter. Yeah. Can you talk about that a little bit? Uh, you yeah. know, it's really funny. Peter and I, it just happens, you know, it really just happens. There's not a lot of rehearsing going into each other's parts. We just really work independently of each other, and it fits anyway. It really does, you know, like I, I play something and Pete comes up with something, or Pete plays something and I come up with something. Of course we all know what everybody's doing, but there's not a kind of lot of stopping and walking up to Peter and saying, wait a minute, Pete, now if you do this on that note and I do that on that note, and, you know, there's not a lot of that kind of analysing it. It's more kind of like play, bang, you know, and then I play, bang, and then it fits. It doesn't fit right. Bang, let's do it like this. You know, we we work very kind of, although we're very aware of what each other's doing, we work very independently as far as writing the parts. Uh, and then when it comes to the uh, recording them, I always say to Peter, hey, what do you think of that? You know, because he's important to his opinion's very important to me. Now, we, we saw you play on the Heyday Tour, and I noticed that you guys live built a set in a real peculiar way. It was almost, I remember it starting almost droney and slow, and, and, and if you would have graphed it, it would just crescendoed into a, almost a frenzy at the end. Yeah. The church, I would like to believe, is a band that can go on stage and play you uh, a delicate, acoustic melancholy tune which is going to make you drift away and then can bang your head against a wall you know and can achieve that um, those two extremes within within the form of, of a two hour concert you know and I think that's I think that's a wonderful thing I mean, sure, some people are going to come along and they're going to say, oh, God, you should have heard that travel by thought thing they did. It was such a racket and all the bloody screaming guitars. You know, and they're going to hate it, you know. And other people are going to come along and say, oh, God, I love the noise. It's all that acoustic stuff I can't stand, you know. And, like, hopefully what we are going to do is, is manage to, to cover all those bases, and I think we do, and I'm very proud that we do. Was this record kind of a, in a way, a do-or-die situation? If this record hadn't have done anything, I don't know what would have happened, because all of us, as I say, have got solo deals anyway. I don't know if everybody would have said, oh, well, you know, there's no point carrying on, is there? Let's face it, we've tried and, and we've failed. The church had been through so many ups and downs that, um, you know, not getting anywhere or being dropped or not having a hit hasn't seemed to bother us ever before, so if this album had done nothing this time, maybe... We would have just sort of gone, oh, well. Anyway, let's write some songs. Now, you live in Sweden, and it seems like the band is really physically kind of split apart. What's the common thread that sort of brings you guys all together? What's the common thread that keeps us all together? The one word that ke kept coming up was surrealism, right? That word has got come up with all three people so far. And I was wondering if that's maybe where it stops with you, right? Yeah, it probably does, actually. Mm -hmm. I'm, not the, um, I'm not the dream monger in this band. You know, I have been and do like that kind of thing in small doses, but I'm probably more English. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not from Australia, you know, mm -hmm. and it, it makes a difference in this band that, that I'm not, you know, because I, although we all get on and have lots of things in common, there's a, a certain kind of vibe in, in Australia which isn't me. It's not, and is, that's a, a dream time type thing, I don't know. I used to like surrealistic things. I used to like Salvador Dali when I was a teenager, and now I hate him with a vengeance, especially as he was a fascist pig, you know? And, like, the other guys wouldn't probably be interested in that, you know? They'd be sort of more interested in whether the picture worked, whereas I'm concerned as to why he painted it. <laughs> 